Brennan, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Justin. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, thanks for coming on. And with Patch, I always like to kind of give a, a briefing here. What is Patch? What are they doing today? Explain this company. Absolutely. So Patch is a software company for interacting with, with what are called environmental markets. So what that means is primarily we sell to corporates or companies that have some sort of climate action strategy or climate goals that they want to accomplish or, or achieve. And we make it easy to achieve those particular goals by giving them access to what's called the voluntary carbon market. That's the ability to effectively buy and sell um, the capacity to sequester carbon dioxide. And so what Patch is, is a B2B marketplace for interacting with the voluntary carbon market. And you can interact with it in a couple of different mediums across the APIs as well as the UIs that we have. But the core piece of value we provide is that software for interacting with those markets. Okay. And do my research. I have like a thousand questions because there's so many different angles to take this. So I want to just like set the scene though, take it back. Why start this company in the first place, Brennan? Yeah, absolutely. So I initially studied chemical engineering at McGill with the intention of working in low carbon energy. That's how I thought I was going to help mitigate the climate crisis. That was kind of the one of probably four or five really big existential problems that humanity faced that I thought was kind of interesting. And so I decided to focus yep. on, on addressing climate change. And I thought I was going to be doing that through energy. Coming out of school, I got jobs in oil and gas, which is the opposite of what I wanted to do. It was energy, but not the right kind of energy. And so instead, I put all the chemical engineering um, on hold and became a software developer at Shopify and then a small hospitality startup called Flapo, which is then put on as Sonder. It was there, my co-founder, Aaron Grunfeld. He was the first employee at Sonder. Uh, I was around the 20th or 25th, and we helped scale that company from a couple dozen people to around around... 1500 to 2000 at its peak. Uh, and that actually Sonder went public earlier this year. It was a really, really fun journey. And back in April, March, April of 2020, Aaron and I started to get the itch to start to do something of our own. We had started a few teams at Sonder across real estate growth, distribution, and supply chain. And I really wanted to see if we could replicate that magic outside of, outside of the wealth finance ecosystem that was Sonder. And I really wanted to bring things back to climate change. It was the whole reason I got a formal education. And at the end of the day, if we were going to spend 60, 70 hours a week on something, and that something is uh, inherently risky and, and has a low probability of success, like startups typically are, I wanted to be on a mission that I thought was a little bit bigger than ourselves. And even if it didn't go well, it was still time well spent. And if we like, had some important conversations and moved the ecosystem forward, even if the financial viability of our company didn't pan out, it was still effort well spent. Um, thankfully patch is working and so we're still, <laughs> we're still around. Um, so I don't have to go cross that bridge just yet, but, uh, that's, that's the founding story. Okay. With that too. So meeting Aaron, obviously you worked with him at Sonder. So you had that experience, but take me through deciding to start a company with him because so many times a founder, they're like, hey, trying to find a co-founder is so challenging. It could be a coworker. It could be a random person that you eventually meet and like get to know each other. But through that, like, did you know, what did it take for you to be like, Hey, we're going to actually start a company together. It's one thing starting something within a another company, but you guys starting a company together. Take me through that, those conversations, what that was like. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the biggest piece or our, our biggest aha moment was actually one particular initiative we were working on, on the supply chain team at, at Sonder. And so a little bit of like behind the scenes on, on how Sonder, the company came to be known. Um, for those who don't know, it's a tech enabled hotel. And so there are all these different apartment buildings around the world that Sonder operates and they use software to make operating them more effectively. Um, you can almost think of it as the residential real estate version of WeWork. And a lot of people know with WeWork, that's an incredibly hard business. that would eventually going to have this like big flare up and flare out moment. Um, that never happened with Sonder in as dramatic of a way, but it was incredibly, incredibly stressful and arduous. Mm. And the situation Aaron and I were actually put in and that we were actually tasked with this idea of launching the supply chain team where we would actually aggregate furniture in central distribution centers and then ship it out to all of our apartments globally in six weeks. The initial plan was to actually hire someone from WeWork who would then kind of was a head of um, supply chain there. They were going to come in and kind of run build this team and we we're going to have three or four months of lead time. Uh, but essentially by the time they ended up starting, uh, they quit after their first week and realizing how insane the prospect of having hundreds and hundreds of different pieces of furniture and SKUs be tracked in many, many different locations. Because the thing that's not like we work is that there's actually thousands of units rather than maybe dozens of locations in a city. And so their solution was, well, let's just send Aaron and Brennan to figure it out instead. 
Um, and so, you know, we managed to actually stand up that team and, and kind of uh, get on board another thousand, two thousand units while we were there. Um, and that was about three or four months uh, of work. And it was probably the most intensely I have worked, uh, where we were actually in the distribution center building the software as well as building the process in order to support that software. And we'd be in the distribution center at like 8 a.m. in Montreal during the winter. So very, very cold and be there to around 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning for like four months straight. And like, so I didn't see the sun for like two or three months. And we came out of that being like, well, that wasn't so bad. Like personally, like that, that entire process sucked, but the act of working with one another uh, didn't boil over. I mean, we were certainly direct with one another when things were and were not working, but never got to the point where there was any animosity. Um, and in some cases we were actually kind of like uh, laughing instead of crying, if you will, just to cope. And so uh, it was kind of coming out of that, that we knew that the, the relationship could handle a huge amount of stress without it breaking. And thankfully, I actually haven't even worked that hard since starting Patch, to be totally honest. Like, I work a lot, but not that much. <laughs> That's not sustainable, obviously, <laughs> in terms of that that level of, of effort. And you hear those stories about startup founders going through that that phase of that, which it can never last forever, that level of craziness, right? I'm curious, though, you mentioned it was like March or April of 2020 that you decided to start this. Like, you actually started Peculiar time to start a company in March, April of 2020. Um, take me through the first couple months of what you guys were doing with this. Did you know right away that we had to raise funding for this immediately? Did you want to build something out first? Take me through that kind of early stages and what the first like iteration of this was even going to be the first few months. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it is a funny time to start a company, but I actually thought it was a really great time because that first year at Patch was a real slog. Like from basically March... April of 2020 to April of 2021, um, we really like didn't accomplish much. Like we, we put in a huge amount of effort, but like not a lot of points were scored, if you will. Um, and the idea of actually having the entire world locked down was actually incredibly helpful in driving out any sort of distraction, right? So you couldn't go anywhere for family holidays. You couldn't go out with friends for, for dinner or drinks or anything else. And, and while that is sad, and there was like all this other kind of crazy stuff and, and negative um, negative things happening in the world, and it was just like an absolute catastrophe from like a humanitarian perspective, um, the idea of be, like not worrying to like leave your little cube because there's nothing else going out in the cube worth getting into was actually very, um, almost in a sense, assuring because like there was nothing to distract you. And you could be 100% laser focused. And I was when we talking about not sustainable. I was rolling out of bed at, you know, six in the morning and kind of my keyboard is right next to me. So I would be programming all day and Aaron would be uh, attempting to sell. Um, and we decided pretty early that we would be, um, that we would raise funds to actually um, start the business. And we raised it probably off of, you know, eight slides and effectively nothing. Um, and the reason we did that was just actually because like Aaron and I uh, didn't really have the like liquidity or like <laughs> savings to like go unpaid. You know, we were both living in San Francisco. It's a very expensive place to live. Um, and like Sonder was still um, uh, was still liquid and we had spent a lot of our personal savings to actually exercise our stock before departing. And so we were kind of, it was kind of like we, if I had kind of earmarked, I think four or five months, like if we don't figure it out in the four or five months, like I have to go back and get a job. Um, thankfully it only took two or three months to, to raise. Um, but that was kind of the, the general dynamic. how did you approach that in terms of fundraising? Because there's so many ways to go about this, who you want as investors, strategic angels, big VCs, especially when you look at your first round of funding, that's a whole nother thing as well. Cause it, do you have pre-seed funds? Do you have, again, angels that invest that early? how do you think about fundraising? How'd you go about that? Take me through like the first round of fundraising for your company. So I think it depends on where you're coming from. Um, so for me, you know, Aaron and I weren't coming from, I think, like a tier one startup. Like, so we weren't coming from like a, a breakout hit, like a Stripe or Plaid or, or a very, very hot company. And so as a result, like the name value of our resume didn't actually mean anything. And so for us, we were not in like a, who are we going to pick <laughs> business? Like we were in a, who's going to pick us business, right? <laughs> Thankfully, that dynamic changed as, as we grew up and became a little bit more self-sufficient. But that first round of funding, I think we probably pitched 60 distinct firms and got literally two yeses and 58 no's, right, over over 45 or 60 days. And, like, talk about, like, emotional roller coasters, like, having to manage your emotion. Where, like, you'd have, like, four or five back-to-back -back meetings and you'd get, like, 
beaten down and they have to go to the next one like still super high and and convicted even though like after that last call like oh that that investor had a good point maybe this is not a good use of my time etc and so like always having to manage your emotion and manage your energy levels especially when so many people are beating down on you was actually quite arduous um so for us it was actually like how do we build the biggest list possible and always try to go in warm you know i think that's both kind of the um you know, good when you're on the inside and definitely bad when you're on the outside of, of venture where warm connections and warm networks can be incredibly powerful. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you don't have those networks, they're going to be isolating, right? And so I think we pretty much had two friends that were founders and a few execs that were investor adjacent at Sonder. And we basically just begged them for <laughs> any intro they would give us. I don't care how junior the investor is or senior, like anyone who will talk to us, please let us talk to them. Um, and then those people who maybe pass, you're like, well, okay, you're passing, but who would you think would be interested in your network? And they're like, oh, well, you know, I want to be perceived as fan or friendly. I'll make it like one or two interest for you. And it's actually just like traversing that graph. Like one of our investors, uh, Pale Blue Dot, who did our pre-seed, they did half a million bucks of our million dollar pre-seed round. They were like, my father knew a founder in Germany who knew an investor who passed, who then knew Campus Jacobson, who did the deal. And so I just kept keep pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling and pulling on that thread um, and just kind of being a little bit shameless, candidly, because it's, it's either like be shameless or die. So, um, <laughs> well, shameless it is. We what go. are the options? <laughs> exactly. It's funny. I have, a, I have a founder community I run. It's like maybe 85 or 90 founders and in there. There's so many variances in terms of their fundraising. Like one of them has like one investor. They got literally landed one investor to close a million dollar pre-seed. The other people have like, again, one investor that went through like hundreds of cold outreaches just to get the one investor. Other ones have multiple investors in there, some angels and some VC. It's like it's, it's never the same. And it's, especially if you don't have those networks already, it's just like you find a way in and then you make the most of that money you get to build the company from there. That's it. You just have to be do. persistent. It's absolutely be persistent. We had this massive spreadsheet and I still look at it every once in a while. Um, from like the pre-seed, seed, and Series A raises because our Series A and Series B were preempted. Um, and so we haven't actually had to like go out to raise um, for like a year and a half or two years. And so like looking at like all the notes, all the reasons people said no, it's, it's definitely like, man, it's put some perspective. It's, uh, we're <laughs> definitely a little bit more in the driver's seat now than we were, you know, two and a half years ago. So. I want to I want to talk about those raises in a second, but I want to take the story continuing on. So you raised a million dollar pre-seed. Uh, you needed to raise the funding early on because that's what you don't really have a ton of capital to to make do that to bootstrap. In the meantime, what did you do with that? What was the use of funds for that million in terms of what that allowed you to get to uh, with what with all you were doing with Patch at that time? Yeah, absolutely. So really, it was just to hire a couple of engineers. So I was the only programmer um, on the team. Aaron was very sales focused, and so he continued with that. And then I went out to hire a couple of engineers. Um, and uh and a designer and that, that was really so it was really just all r d we played it we actually added one other person to help aaron sell that didn't work out we quickly made a correction after the first 45 days um and then really like that was kind of like classic first time founder like adding more sales capacity <laughs> is helpful but most sales people like need a playbook and so sticking the founder-led sales for as long as possible was kind of the model we followed um and, you know, thankfully that kind of got us to the point where we actually were getting some inbound interest after we launched coming off of our September launch of 2020 from Andreessen Horowitz and KOTU. Um, Andreessen Horowitz is the one who ended up doing the deal. Jeff Jordan, who's on the board of Airbnb and Instacart. Uh, but that actually happened in October. So it was actually, it was actually pretty quick where we kind of raised yeah. the pre-seed, uh, the $1.2 million pre-seed, and then raised the $4.5 million seed from Andreessen uh, six months later. With that too, so going from that, people are going to hear this and be like, wait, what? They raised that much, that that quickly with a tier one VC? Take me through what the product even was at that time. Because these marketplaces, double-sided marketplaces, supply demand, you're always trying to figure these pieces out. What did you build out though? Like with that million and eight point two, you hired some people, which was great. You said you had to, you're doing spinal led sales, but like, what were you selling at the time? Like what was this platform back then, even in like the, at that time? So back then, it was primarily just an API as a marketplace business. So we actually had no visual component. It was purely a developer tool. And we were selling it uh, primarily to small e-commerce brands and e-commerce platforms and one or two fintechs who wanted to embed some form of climate action into their product or service. The benefit of actually having a B2B motion versus like a peer-to-peer marketplace or, or consumer-to-consumer marketplace is that... B2B marketplaces actually don't have that dissimilar of a sales cycle from enterprise software. 
And so it makes overcoming that cold start problem significantly easier because you have a pipeline and so you have an idea around uh, who's going to close when and why and what kind of volume they're going to want. And so it's actually really easy that, you know, two days before that deal is going to close, you go and knock on the supplier's door and say, hey, I have $50,000 for you. Sign this MSA to get on patch and I'll give you the $50,000. And, you know, not many people are going to say no to that proposition. And then once that supplier is on the platform, that's like how you seed the network with supply. So people often are trying to figure out how to overcome the classic cold start problem, which is, okay, do I get supply first or demand first? In our case, getting demand first was much easier because we could effectively slow play the demand until we had the supply lined up. There are some situations and many um, peer-to-peer marketplaces starting with supply is actually a bit easier to attract consumers. Where am I going to find that aggregated view? That was not the case for us. For you guys too at the time, so you mentioned Aaron doing more of the sales side of it. I mean, what was, what was that pitch in terms of why people were working with you? I mean, was there nothing like this in the market at all out there? Was it you're differentiated in some capacity from them that they cho- chose patch? Take me through that side of things. I love in the early days where it's like, you start from nothing. Like, who, who are these guys? I don't know who patch is. And you obviously convinced them to work with you. Take me through that at that time. Like, what, what was the pitch and why were they working with you? Yeah. So, I mean, there's really like no precedent for a company like patch existing in 2020, right? Yeah. It's purely a category creation business, not a category disruption business, where we are making the appeal of there's a secular trend where millennials and Gen Z are some of the most value aligned shoppers um, of their of, of any generation, right? Like yeah. boomers and Gen, Gen X typically had an uh, index towards mass market. We're kind of now moving to the more world of curation, but as well as value aligned shopping uh, and transacting in general. And as a result, they're going to focus on things that align with their value system. And one of the kind of core pieces of value that they have or that they care about, excuse me, is climate change. There are other things they care about as well, whether it's kind of social or civil issues. But one of the kind of core pieces is climate change, because those are the first two generations we're going to be purely affected by climate change in their lifetime. Right. And so our appeal to them was, well, you should actually embed this into your product or service, not because it's a good thing to do, but it's actually going to help you with customer acquisition and customer retention. And it's going to be a differentiator if you're a credit card company or an e-commerce company, why should I shop with you versus something else? One of the reasons is we're a more sustainable brand that aligns with value systems. So that was the actual pitch to suppliers, or sorry, to, to purchasers. From that, so it's so crazy. Like, obviously, they didn't have anything like this in the market, which I'm always perplexed by, like, why now, I guess, in terms of the timing and why this is able to happen. I'm always curious about that. But then take me through, you mentioned, you know, Andreessen Horowitz basically came to you. It was it because of that whole category creation side of things they saw that you were creating this whole entire new market or like, what was their, what was that thought on their side of it? But yeah, like we have to invest in patch. Yeah. So they, they were, they were developing a thesis around, around the space, um, specifically our voluntary carbon markets, which is kind of like the market our software sits on top of. Where they actually believe, like most people believe, that voluntary carbon market is going to grow to be around a hundred billion dollar market. Right now, it's a five billion dollar market. It's going to grow to a hundred billion dollar market by twenty thirty, and a five hundred billion dollar market by twenty fifty. And so, this is very much a how do you find uh, a great winner who is a market leader and then can ride that secular growth curve? That that's kind of the underlying thing. So they're trying to figure out well, who's going to be that thing. And so, Patch fit that bucket, and there are one or two other companies that fit that bucket as well. Um, but what actually um, resulted in Andreessen believing in us, Andreessen Horowitz believing in us. Um, We worked with Jeff Jordan there. He actually just knew both founders um, from Sonder, actually, from his time at at Airbnb. And so he was familiar with Francis and Lucas. um, And he actually had a huge amount of respect for them as founders because he he knew how hard that business was and how difficult it was. And so when they called them to be like, what's the deal with this Brennan and Aaron guy? They were like, number one, we're both invested. And so we're long and we think they're going to they're crush it. And two, they were some of the best folks that we had at our company. And you know how insane our company was and how hard it was to run that business. And so that was actually, that vouching is actually what was the catalyst for us. Not so much just the, our particular pitch or product, but you know, and when you're seed investing, it's primarily market, uh, product, and people. And they, were able, they kind of believed in, the market already product was like, yeah, I think that might work or it might not work, but it was kind of we indexed really hard on, on the people in the market front for them. Yeah. And I want to go through the, a couple of things. One, I want to go through what's fueled your growth. Come back to that in one second. 
But then too, looking at all things you've done with the product, you said you launched with the product initially, obviously doing sales with that product evolves over time. I want to talk about the product first and then we'll go through growth product side. Like take me to like what the product's at today. So we're talking, we talked about kind of early stages. This is about two years ago, let's just say, and now we're, you know, we're end of 2022 here. What does the product look like today? And I'm, I'm curious about that side of things. Yeah, absolutely. So the way I think about patch as a buyer is that it's essentially like Lego bricks for transacting with environmental markets. And so what that means is that there are three core dimensions on, um, uh, of this kind of problem. The first is where that transaction takes place. That's the medium. We started with the API. We then would launch a couple months later, the dashboard product where basically the dashboard and API would have feature parity. And then we also then launched a series of hosted checkout products where maybe you wanted to have some sort of lightweight in integration, but you didn't want to be managing things like payment processing, internationalization, FX. And so we're kind of, there's like a happy hybrid model. Yeah. The second dimension is the shape of the transaction, right? And so we started with a small, um, with spot markets where it's primarily small purchases, you know, hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars, typically that range. Um, we've actually recently just launched a couple of weeks ago, our long-term offtake product, which are actually multi-year fixed volume contracts that are bankable. So we launched with um, Bain and Company, the management consulting firm, and they're actually managing their long-term offtake agreements through the past product. But that's millions of dollars a year. So that's a much, much larger scale. And then the third and final dimension is what you're transacting, where today we're working in the voluntary carbon market, uh, but we're, the way we built our product is to actually enable us to grow into other environmental markets as well. And the idea behind Patch is to actually, as a buyer, to enable the unique combination of any of these three dimensions. So if you want to create an offtake for voluntary carbon, the UI, you can. If you want to integrate spot markets by API, you can. And the idea is the way you're going to capture that $100 billion market in 2030 is by being flexible and by providing Lego bricks to build all these different interfaces and products that map to a really wide variety of use cases that are going to emerge over the next decade. You mentioned Bain and Company. You have some other, obviously, big com uh, customers as, as well uh, using you guys. Take me through that growth. What has fueled the growth? You mentioned sales early on. Final led sales is like the early days. Was it like you built a massive sales team? Was it like you got the PR? What, what was what was fueling the growth of Patch even to this point now? Yeah, absolutely. So it's been primarily PR and outbound sales for the most part. Um, we've been very kind of PR and sales light historically. That's actually not beginning to change. We're becoming we're becoming more marketing and product led. So like the former, you could think of as sales led growth and the latter you could think of as like product led growth. Um, and so we actually want to have both motions that complement each other. But with the, but for the most part, almost all of kind of the big logos you see on Patch's website have come from us either finding a way to the account, us having a, an intro to them. And sometimes people coming to us because they saw us on a podcast or a newspaper or something like that. Why was that always a strategy from the beginning? Like you knew that was going to happen or I'm just curious. So PR, PR was always yeah. the strategy. And the reason that was, was primarily because it's a, we're in the market making or market creation business. And because of that, not everyone is going to be along that adoption curve at the same time. So you can't, it's not like payments where we know everyone wants digital payments. <laughs> we're just going to find the people and prove that our product is better and find a way to disrupt them. Right. With carbon in general, people are not, not everyone is convinced that they need to have this in their business. And so what's important for us is making sure that when they have that intent, their mind immediately goes to patch. And that was why PR and marketing was such an important piece of our strategy and it continues to be is because we have to effectively prime the market so that when people get to the point of, okay, I am ready to transact, I am ready to make a decision, well, who's the de facto player? Type in carbon credits in SEO, or maybe you ask a colleague who's launched the product already, Patch is one of the first names that comes up every single time. And that's what's really important for us. Why the switch then? So you, know, you said now you're kind of thinking about this little switch a little bit with a, a little bit more marketing versus the sales uh, side of things, two years in roughly. What, what is it about this timing that made you kind of switch that and do both? It's a great question. So the, it's, not, it's not one or the other. It's, the, it's a yes and. And the reason yeah. is outbound sales is expensive, right? And if we can find a way to activate and retain customers, in a way where we can keep CAC low, uh, then we're going to. And, and product is usually a good way to do that. Um, now, we're not going to be doing a meaningful amount of paid marketing. That is not a, um, not, we don't believe that's time well spent today. 
but content, webinars, events, things like this, as well as actually having kind of growth loops built into the system where suppliers can refer their customers or buyers can refer other buyers is definitely on the roadmap. With all this too, so getting funding, growing the company, sales, all this. Okay, there's obviously then people that you're hiring at your team itself. Take me through that. So I think like your approach to hiring. I saw there's some questions around like non-negotiables you have. Just take me through how you think about hiring because especially any you know high growth startup, that's a huge part of what you're doing. Your team is everything. How do you approach hiring at Patch? Yeah, absolutely. So I actually think on average, um, and you know I think we're beginning to see that right now a little bit, especially with big tech. Um, there's been a tendency to overhire. And I think people don't think critically about how much true productivity or effort or impact one person can actually drive within an organization. And so for us, we're taking the strategy of actually having far fewer people at the company um, rather than more. So our company is about 65 people right now. Other comparable companies at our stage are probably on the scale of 100 or 150. Uh, and we actually don't want to do that. One, because like more overhead, just for the sake of overhead, is like not particularly useful. And two, we tend to actually do our best to truly hire the best people, truly hire, uh, hiring A players. And what that, the way that folds into the hiring process basically means you're doing probably an order of magnitude more phone screens. Um, and you're really kind of holding out for like the perfect type of profile usually. Yeah. And so that means hiring is much, much slower in the early days because finding that incremental person, like you're going to get a lot of no's because the truly best people are going to be like, well, why would I join this weird niche company? That doesn't make any sense. And so you really find like a really nice collection of, of, of missionaries who really believe in the mission. And then once you have those really great people, then they can refer in like, what's the, like every, like every day, every time someone starts, we had two engineers start yesterday. First question is who are the best three people you have ever worked in, in your entire life. I don't care if it was a last job. I don't care if you were an intern and they were super senior. Like who are the best three people? I don't care if they're not looking for a job. Just give me 30 minutes with them. I just want to talk to them for 30 minutes and kind of play, make the connection. And eventually <laughs> they're going to work a patch. Um, and that's true. Like we've had people who have said no to us and then come back six months later. We've had people that we made offers to two years ago in 2020 and they were joined 18 months later. Um, and so for us, we're very much playing this multi-decade game to find truly the best people rather than just a lot of people. That's good for our cost structure, uh, but it's also good for like the talent density within the organization. It's a very, very high ownership, high performance ecosystem because we hold that bar and we wait. With your fundraising, so you, you mentioned obviously Andreessen Horowitz was the, the seed round, and then you had KOTU come in later, and then you had Series B as well. Those conversations with investors, they, they're seeing the big tech layoffs. They're seeing that stuff too. Is that also them sharing a similar viewpoint on that? Them saying like, oh yeah, or are they trying to like make you grow faster? I'm just curious on how that's gone between that because, you know, at Vitalize, for instance, we talk to founders all the time. So it's always like figuring out the back and forth of what they're thinking, what we're thinking. Just how has that been with your investors as you've gone through this? Yeah, absolutely. So our investors um, tend to be pretty, um, I'd say nuanced. And it's not actually, and nuance I think is sometimes mixed with like overcomplicating something. And what I mean by that is like, especially in 2021, everyone was like, all systems go, turn it all on, faucets yeah. open, go crazy. Um, we didn't, we weren't doing that. Although we were benefiting from the capital environment where we were able to raise a lot of money very, very quickly, we actually weren't mirroring headcount in that way. We were just kind of building the balance sheet, if you will, building the war chest. Because we had a feeling that the party was going to be over and it was going to be over for a long time. Um, that turned, that's turning out to be fairly accurate. Um, and so for them, it's really all a matter of if you put in a dollar, does a buck fifty or two bucks come out the other side? There are very easy fit ways to um, kind of make that bet. Like with AEs, are they hitting quota? Are they exceeding quota? Okay, well then we should just add another one because they pay for themselves and then some. So like, let's keep doing that. That's really easy math. And then you have things like R&D and marketing you have to be a little more critical, which basically means that you have to probably hire up to a certain point. We, we actually hire engineering teams in like sprints of four. So we actually like an engineering team or a product team at Patch is one PM, one designer and four engineers. That's it. Uh, we have um, three teams at Patch to build all the product, which basically means we have 12 engineers, three product designers and three PM. That builds all the product that gets used by some of the biggest banks in the world, some of the kind of largest private equity firms in the world, e-commerce platforms, et cetera. 
nothing's falling over. Everything's working great. <laughs> Our SLAs work well. You just kind of have to focus on what's important. Um, and so for us, it's really a matter of, you know, once you've hired those four or five people, you typically give them a, we try to get signal on, is this thing going to work? And are we going to value in like one to two quarters? If you do, okay, well then add more or add more additional products. And if you don't merge them into other things that aren't working, because the thing, the good thing about us is we're always running a couple bets in parallel and there's always one or two things working. So it's easy to reallocate people internally. With what you're doing inherently as a marketplace, I'm curious on what that vetting process looks like on, on the side of where you're looking at, like the, selling carbon credits or other things, those companies that have these different products are doing, what does that vetting process look like? Are you, it has to do a lot of outbound to even get them on. People are seeing the platform now. Like what is that vetting process and how you get in those people on that side of things? I'm curious. Yeah. So back in, back in 2020, it was almost exclusively outbound, right? Uh, no one knew who we were. They didn't want to like this concept of a marketplace was actually foreign to them. There are carbon credit yeah. exchanges that allow for speculation on carbon, but the idea of getting incremental demand for the sake of retiring was very, very novel to um, carbon credit developers back in 2020. Um, and now that's actually inverted. It's about 90% inbound and 10% outbound. So there's like maybe one or two accounts that won't organically come to us that we want to go out to, but a lot of people are coming and knocking on Patch's door because of all the PR and brand marketing and awareness we've done. So that's working really well. As far as vetting, the way we kind of treat um, the onboarding process of the Patch is we have this concept because um, carbon, software for carbon is kind of like this double layered abstract idea where you basically have invisible software managing invisible gas right so like how do how do you make that real and how do you help people understand like am i actually getting the service that i thought i was paying for and the idea behind patch is really driving towards a world um, where trust is enabled through transparency where we do a huge amount of work quantifying the attributes of the underlying tons of carbon that are sold on patch so there are all these different kind of concepts. So there's like things more intuitive, like price um, or geography of the particular project. But then there are things that are more nuanced, like chemical pathway. What's the associated mm -hmm. mechanism? Or like, what's the durability, which is how long that positive environmental effect lasts for. We capture all this information and standardize it and put it to the patch platform. In order to list on patch though, you actually have to have a third party, a vetted third party, prove that that data you're putting into patch is accurate. So that's a very important nuance, which is patch is not the certifier or verifier. We actually have a bench of verifiers and certifiers that we work with that then do the work that then allows them to be on board with the patch. And the reason for that just simply comes down to incentives where we'd be highly incentivized at scale to say everything's good all the time because we want more supply, right? So how do you have that structural boundary? It's by working with other parties that aren't incentivized by the same things patch is incentivized by. You talked a little bit, like just briefly touching on price, just send me through a business model, how you thought about that. Has it remained the same from the beginning to today? I mean, has it evolved? I've talked to businesses who have gone through a total change in terms of their business model. Some have been the same for like six years, you just change the price maybe. How have you thought about that in terms of uh, how it works at Patch? Yeah, absolutely. So we started out with a fairly intuitive model for marketplaces where you have a take rate, where you're basically getting charged somewhere between 10 to 20%, depending on volume and usage of the platform. Uh, for every for every dollar you push through. And, and that's what we start out with. And that's what we had for 2020 and 2021. In 2022, we've introduced as something to layer on top of it that we refer to as platform fees, which is really just the idea of some sort of annualized recurring platform fee in addition to your usage-based fees. And the reason we have that annualized fee is actually paying for other more sophisticated software and tools, whether it's API access, specific rate limits, specific types of information, or different types of transaction types or functionality that you might want access to that otherwise isn't in the base sign on, transact and sign off type model. And so it's kind of more a, an expansion of the um, kind of the revenue model than actually a change within it. With inherently what Patch is doing, you obviously come up across a ton of climate projects and founders doing interesting things. What are some of the most interesting things that you've just personally seen in climate? People working on this, these issues that we're dealing with here, because uh, you're in you're in it, you're seeing things like probably every day. I'm curious on what you've seen and what the most maybe interesting projects are. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so I think chemically, like in Patch's world directly, I think something that's really interesting is uh, this company called Charm Industrial. It's founded by Peter Reinhardt, who's the CEO of Segment, uh, and has now started uh, a carbon removal company. They're a supplier on Patch and sell through Patch. And essentially what they're doing is they're taking uh, waste 
feedstock or waste biomass that would normally decompose and create carbon emissions in the forms of both carbon dioxide and methane. Uh, and actually putting it through a novel process they've developed called fast pyrolysis, which then kind of, it's basically this idea of heating up this biomass that would normally decompose in the absence of oxygen, such that it creates this bio oil, it creates this sludge. Mm. And then they actually inject it underground, which effectively takes it out of the carbon cycle. So you have the photosynthesis of maybe an almond tree or corn, and you have all these leftover almond shells and corn husks that would normally emit CO2 and re-enter the cycle. But now what they're doing is actually they're breaking the cycle. They're taking those husks and those corn and those almond shells and putting them underground in actually old oil wells in, in some cases. It's kind of interesting. It's almost like reversing the uh, drilling of oil, which I think is fascinating. Interesting. And any one more? I was, I'm just curious because you you come across. Yeah, yeah totally, totally. <laughs> I think I think I think I think one um, one that I actually have a, a really big affinity for that I think is going to become an absolutely massive. I mean, it's already a big business, but it's become an absolutely massive business. Um, is Arcadia? Um, so historically, Arcadia, um, founded by a curator who's a good friend of mine, um, was a community solar business where it basically allowed consumers to procure renewable energy or develop community solar uh, in kind of wherever they live to get access to renewable energy. They've since evolved that model actually into a B2B business platform or B2B data platform um, that enables primarily um, software companies to get access to enterprise kind of quality and uh, clean utility data to then build products and services on top of. So it's almost kind of like the, I don't like these kind of X or Y's, but it is kind of very much like the plaid for energy or utility data where you then as a carbon accounting platform, maybe as an engineering consultancy, are able to actually get all this utility data from your customers and then build insights and information on top of it. Um, for those who don't know, utility data is an absolute disaster. There's PDF parsing and information yeah. downloading and CSV cleaning all happening behind the scenes. So if you think about like the schlep factor of startups, like this is a very high schlep factor business. Like no one wants to be doing this highly, highly unsexy work. And uh, everyone wants yeah. to be interacting with Arcadia. It's really nice, clean API where all the information comes out super clean. I love that. That's awesome. I mean, there's so many opportunities with that still today. I mean, I look at ones in like construction where they're doing, again, PDFs and that sort of thing in that industry, which is insane, like bonkers to me that it's still the way it goes. One of the last questions I have, I'm curious about is just recently you did like a new brand identity, which looks amazing, by the way. I'm curious as to how you approach that and the timing on that. Obviously, you raise a bunch of funding, but it's like, at what point do you rebrand? Because I we just saw another cap, uh, another company, Party Round, rebranded as Capital. I know Jordy Hayes, so I've talked to him a bunch. I saw their rebrand after they, I think they either raised more money or something happened. For you guys, though, at Patch, rebrand looks great. How did you decide to do that, the timing wise, and why it was like now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, so I, I can't speak for for Party Round specifically, but like the. It typically, a, a rebrand typically comes at a moment where you want to go through some sort of maturation uh, within the business, in, in my opinion. And so for them, you know, they might have decided, okay, you know, this is the time where, you know, we maybe the idea of party rounds is very in vogue in 2021, <laughs> and now it can't be perceived as that in 2022. So we need a more refined look yeah. to it. I'm not super sure. In the world of Patch, for example, we had actually been kind of building upon the brand foundation that my wife and I had done back in 2020. And so we were really building on a foundation that, and then and brand assumptions that really didn't exist anymore. And like the idea of Patch had really dramatically expanded to become far, far more ambitious, but our brand didn't really tell that story or embody that. And in many cases, people were coming to Patch thinking that we were one thing or thinking we were only something else. And the idea of this kind of much grander future they were trying to build for really wasn't encapsulated with that brand. And so when we had raised that Series B, it kind of felt like the time where, you know, really good branding agencies, we worked with this one called Kodo, uh, an absolutely phenomenal firm. They did Airbnb's rebrand. It's kind of one of the things they're famous for. Uh, but they're very expensive, right? Hundreds of thousands so. of dollars. <laughs> yeah. um, and so because of that, like, you have to make sure that the kind of investment you're making makes sense at the stage of the business. And for us, we really wanted to have a brand where, you know, we can grow into it over the next four or five, six years. And I think we really can with this. And we really need to make sure that we we're up leveling the aesthetic of our brands, to make sure they map to the enterprise clients that we were selling to. Yeah, I see that that evolution for companies. And it's oh, I'm always curious about the timing in terms of why they decide to do it when they do it. But it does give you this whole new feel and look, and especially if you have all these people doing sales, you're doing so much marketing content, like all of that comes back to people seeing 
your brand, your story, all those things, which makes it in theory worth it uh, for you know, years and years from now. But as wrapping things up here, I'm just curious on this too, like, what's next for for Patch? Uh, and then any way people can get involved, they want to either join the company or help out in some capacity as well. Yeah, absolutely. So if you want either access to the platform or to join the team, we're still hiring for a couple of roles this year. So head over to patch.io, P-A-T-C-H.io, and there's both ability to request access as well as to apply for some of the roles we have open across engineering go to market. So come on down. We'd love to have you. Um, as far as what's next, it's kind of doing more of the same, where we actually feel really great about a lot of our products that we built this year, especially in Q3 and Q4. And as we head into Q, uh, sorry, 2023, it's actually going to be more a matter of how do we focus down on the verticals we're selling into and really kind of go from maybe, you know, 1%, 2% market penetration to like double digit, mid double digit market penetration, the same markets we're selling into. So it's going to be more around, okay, we've kind of gone to zero to one. How do we go one to end in 2023? Brendan, what's the best place for people to contact you, get in touch if they'd like to as well? Absolutely. So probably most responsive on Twitter, actually. So I'm East Fallacy and then an underscore on Twitter. Um, LinkedIn is a bit of a bit of a, a graveyard <laughs> at this point, so I'd recommend not, not going through that route. Perfect. Brendan, thank you so much for the time today. Really appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin.